Thanks for joining us today. My name is Marianne Peacock and I'm the project coordinator for the Transformative Change Initiative. I want to welcome you on behalf of the Office of Community College Research and Leadership to Going Big, How to Scale Innovation for Transformative Change. I think we have a really good program for you today. First, just a few logistical questions. All participants are currently muted to reduce background noise. We're asking that you submit your questions and comments today using the chat to all function mm -hmm. and also the question function. We will not be using the raise a hand function because we have so many, call, uh, so many people who are attending the webinar. We have about 150 people on the call today. A few of you did submit questions via email prior to the webinar, and thank you for that. I've been collecting those questions. I'll be tracking your questions throughout the program, and I'll present as many, of, as, many as possible to our presenters at the end. If you do get bounced off the call, please just log back in using the same information provided. You are not blocked from re-entering the call. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording and slides will be available after the program for review and for sharing with your colleagues. Right now, I'm going to hand this over to Deborah Bragg from the Office of, Communi Office of Community College Research and Leadership here at the University of Illinois. Deborah? Thank you, Marianne. It's a real pleasure to be part of this webinar today and uh, to be representing our Transformative Change Initiative uh, project. I want to start by thanking our funders. Uh, the Lumina Foundation, the Joyce Foundation, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, without their interest in the issues around scaling innovation and, and really uh, looking at this historic time with the, trans, uh, the Trade Adjustment Act uh, grants that have been awarded by the Department of Labor to community colleges, um, none of us would be probably here and interested in, in this topic as we are. Um, the, the team of folks here at OCCRL includes Marianne Peacock, who you just heard from, as well as Heather McCambly, who's assisting with this webinar. I also want to acknowledge a couple of the other folks from OCCRL who, who, who you'll hear on the call and that is Heather Fox and, and Deborah Ritchie, who uh, will be presenting as well. We also want to um, thank our co, um, our partner in this work, and that is the Collaboratory led by Mindy Feldbaum. Um, next slide. The Transformative Change Initiative um, has been an active project with the Office of Community College Research and Leadership for about three years now. Um, our work is dedicated to assisting community colleges to scale innovation that, that improve student outcomes as well as program organization and system performance. Um, we're all about helping community colleges and their partners, including the workforce agencies, employers, community-based groups, universities, K-12, whoever those partners are, uh, to come together with community colleges to improve equity and outcomes for all students. Next slide. Um, just to give you a little background, the Transformative Change Initiative Network really began in the fall of 2012 um, when the Collaboratory and OCCRL were awarded funds from our sponsors, and we identified 19 Round 1 and Round 2 consortia who had been funded by the Trade Adjustment Act or the TAC uh, grants by the Department of Labor. And over 230 community colleges were part of our initiating uh, the TCI network. In 2014, we added round three, and all of the round one and two and three consortia were invited to participate in PCI. And this uh, year, in 2015, we welcomed round four. Um, what that means is these colleges have representatives who are part of our network, part of our communication, and receive uh, invitations to participate in our 
learning lab that's conducted annually, and I'll say more about that, as well as um, in webinars and to also receive uh, many of our materials. Um, at, at our last uh, communication with the Department of Labor in February at our learning lab, um, they mentioned that over 60% of all community colleges in the United States have now been funded by tax. Um, and I suspect that number may even be higher. Uh, I mentioned the learning labs. Each uh, February, over the last three years, we've conducted a meeting that has brought together practitioners, policy leaders, experts, and others who uh, get together and really think about the potential for scaling innovation that will bring about greater equity and greater impact for um, students who are participating in community college programs. The labs feature a program where there's a lot of sharing, networking, a lot of learning from experts who um, may not be readily accessible because they're in high demand and those individuals are part of our program. Um, and really an opportunity for also for the consortium participants to learn from one another. Next slide. Uh, we have created at OCCRL and on our website what we call the Transformative Change Knowledge Center. On the Knowledge Center, uh, you can find a lot of materials, and some of them are mentioned here. Um, a listing of the guiding principles uh, is there, as well as fairly extensive two-page descriptions of what those principles mean. Um, the strategy briefs, which I'll say more about, are there as well as bibliographies, podcasts, um, uh, PowerPoints from webinars, and also our scaling toolkit. I mentioned the strategy briefs. Um, the strategy briefs have really uh, become kind of a signature product of the Transformative Change Initiative. We have now completed about 12 of these strategy briefs, and they they feature consortiums who have been funded in round one and two and who have uh, implemented strategies that are, are related to student success. And um, each strategy brief has fairly uh, similar information on the goals, the, the practices that are part of this, as well as uh, critical outcomes and results that the, um, the consortium are beginning to find. We work in partnership with the third-party evaluators of these consortia to ensure that the data that we're reporting reflects what is actually being shared with the Department of Labor and other stakeholders. I'm now um, delighted to be able to introduce to you, uh, Leah Wookie, who will be uh, talking about the consortium that she evaluates as well as Maria Feet, who is uh, head of a consortium um, that uh, is, is headed up in Colorado. So with that, Leah, I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to share with you all today. As Deborah was saying, I, uh, I serve as the evaluator <clears throat> excuse me, for the Demand Project, which is a tribal college consortium. Um, and it stands for Developing Montana and North Dakota Workforce. And it's the only consortium in a TAC grant that is uh, comprised solely of tribal colleges. And those colleges are United Tribes Technical College out of Bismarck, which is the lead, and uh, Chandeska Chikana Community College out of Spirit Lake, Fort Totten, North, North Dakota. Um, two colleges in Montana, one is Fort Peck Community College out of Poplar, Montana, and Aani Nakota College out of Harlem, Montana, from the Fort Belknap Reservation. So they're pretty well spread out. Um, but they, this project uh, developed occupations to meet the needs created by the oil boom. So they're everything from carpentry, CDL, um, HVAC, they've got um, 
heavy equipment operator, electrical lineman, welding, as well as some um, medical occupations, uh, CNA, um, e EMT, phlebotomy, those kinds of things. Um, the primary primary strategy that was addressed in this project was accelerated and short-term training through block scheduling, and they've had some great successes with that. And they're focusing mostly on engaging unemployed men on the reservations. So, um, and, and they're doing well with with targeting them through some of the some of the uh, storytelling that I'll be talking about later. Thank you, Leah. Um, we're going to hear now from Maria Fees from the Consortium for Healthcare Education Online, or CHEO. Thank you so much, and thank you to OCCRL and staff for including us. We're, we're thrilled to be here. I'm Maria Feith, the Project Director for the Consortium for Healthcare Education Online, and we affectionately know it as CHEO. Pueblo Community College in Pueblo, Colorado is the lead, and we are a five-state, eight-college consortium. And with PCC's um, exemplary support, the CHEO administrative team and I do most of our work in cyberspace, and I'm blessed to work with some pretty amazing program of fiscal leaders that are located at PCC and at partner colleges, including Flathead Valley Community College and Great Falls College, MSU, both in Montana, Laramie County Community College in Wyoming, Lake Area Tech in South Dakota, Kodiak College on Kodiak Island in Alaska, and our Colorado sister college is Red Rocks Community College located in Denver, and Otero Junior College in Southeast Colorado. CHEO is designing online and hybrid coursework for 21 health-related programs like EMS, radiology, medical coding, and others through the innovative use of technology and evidence-based instructional design. In order to build and revise healthcare programming, CHEO instructional designers are located at each college and have worked with faculty to create or redesign over 100 courses. OER is being uploaded to Project and, and Skills Commons repositories, as they are in all of the TAC projects. One of the CHEO strategies is to provide extensive career services, and we've built a comprehensive career hub located at planyourhealthcareer.org. This interactive hub provides common ground for CHEO coaches, employers, workforce, and students. And this is a place where coaches can help students toward um, highlighting their skills and talents and where they can, students can create interactive portfolios that include individual professional websites for each student. It's a way to present and update professional documents and to be identified as prime candidates for upcoming internships or more permanent positions. Coaches and workforce and employers can message specific populations using the hub and um, lead students directly to an organization's HR page, job posting, job fairs, and, and more. CHEO coaches are doing a great job for us and have served almost 5,000 students to date with 91% of incumbents receiving wage increases so far. CHEO is absolutely a, stu a student-centered project and we are very interested in connecting students to their own learning and have deployed a robust collection of methods in which to accomplish that. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in a moment, but one tool is uh, called the Lightboard and coming out of Flathead Valley. And the Lightboard technology integrates multiple components of a lesson into one dynamic scene and connects students in a face-to-face -face simulated environment promising reform in student engagement. Pretty big stuff. If, if my chemistry instructors had been able to make their courses come alive the way this tool can, I have no doubt it would have altered my career path toward the sciences or the healthcare industry. Additionally, CHEO partner colleges are either about to deploy the light board or are taking a close look at adding it to their collection. It is seriously cool stuff. We also partnered with the North American Network of Science Labs Online, or NANSLO and created a new online science lab at Great Falls College and updated two other sites, one at Red Rocks Community College in Denver. The first lab is the brainchild of Albert Balbon out of North Island College in British Columbia. Nandlo provides real-time experiences. These are not simulations. They're real-time experiences for students and gives faculty an opportunity to offer labs using high-end equipment that they probably wouldn't be able to afford otherwise. Currently, we offer 27 different experiments, 
in biology and in chemistry. They're guided by real-life lab techs. Students can work remotely in groups, and they run experiments from a distance in real time. So NANZO plays a big role for us, and to date, courses with over 3,000 students enrolled have had NANZO lab experiments embedded. We see the potential as limitless for us. Very exciting work that has required faculty and administrators to consider how delivery of instruction can look. We are clear that those of us in the educational arena must think differently in order to meet the needs of the global economy. And it's tools like these that epitomize what I recall hearing at, uh, this, at last year's um, or this past year's Learning Lab in Baltimore described as, as disruptive innovation. <laughs> Thanks. Think, next slide. Well, great. Thank you so much, Maria and Leah. You've, you've really um, kicked this off uh, in a great way. I'm going to just kind of give you the perspective on innovation and scaling. I think you can already see why that's such an important topic. So the next slide. Um, built in to the TAC grants is this notion of a consortium. So already the structure of these grants are all about scaling and moving great ideas from one community college to another and to their partners. So it, it was a natural to begin to ask um, ourselves at OCCRL, um, you know, what's really happening in this context? And we reached out to the literature and really very much liked uh, this model that is part of the open book of social innovation. Um, you can see in this model that uh, innovation starts, it's a cycle, and it starts with there's something that prompts it. Um, there's often a response to proposals, as we saw in the TAC grants. There's a prototyping or building of implementation of new ideas, and then moving through to sustaining, scaling, and systemic change. Um, the other reason we want to bring this model to your attention is that while those of us in education think about educational innovations, this model is really focused on social innovations. And we would point out that the kinds of changes we're talking about making through education have larger impacts on the economy and on society itself. And that's why we define the scaling of transformative change is, is really about raising individual, organizational, and system performance without losing that historic mission that the community college has had around access and equity. So a lot of change can come about, but we would suggest it's really important to keep in touch with that core mission of making college accessible to students and opening up those opportunities. And I think you can see how these two consortium who are, are sharing some time with us on this webinar today, I think you can see um, that access is really, really important to them and meeting their, their students' needs with, with tangible outcomes. The next slide. This is a visual um, in which we tried to lay out some of the core ideas that we think are critical to the scaling of innovation, uh, particularly in the context of tact and in the context of community colleges. So we're going to pull each of these um, ideas apart and talk about them just a little bit. Um, so the next slide um, is one that will uh, focus on the first four guiding principles, and I'm now going to turn uh, this microphone over to Heather Fox, who will be talking with you about these principles. Thank you, Deborah, for that elegant introduction to the TCI guiding principles for scaling. Um, I'm excited. I get to talk about the first four guiding principles, um, the first of which um, I'll be talking about is leadership. Um, and as you can see on your screen for each of these, we have provided you the full principle along with a set of design elements. These design elements highlight some of the key concepts about the principle, but like Deborah mentioned earlier, we have a lot more material on our website, so I encourage people who are interested to follow up 
um, by looking there and reading um, more in depth about each of these principles. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of leadership and I want to start by talking about the fact that transformative leadership is not about a specific role or position. Um, leadership or transformative leadership is one that's distributed among many people that are contributing to the initiative and that allows for shared leadership and also allows for a tapping of multiple sets of talents which is really important when you're talking about transformative change and this kind of scaled model. Transformative leaders focus both on the people and on performance, so they're looking at ways of transforming the way we do practice in order to create a more democratic and just society. They are advocates for change in action and attitudes, which is necessary to create opportunities for students. Um, this concept of equity is really the a core um, component to transformative leadership. Uh, and part of that is ensuring that the voices of underserved populations are both sought out and listened to, um, and that, that's taken into account with major decisions about the initiative. Um, so they, they, they work together, since we have a, a group of distributed transformative leaders, to build evidence and performance-based organizations uh, and systems that allow innovations to both endure and spread and that support positive outcomes for all students. Next slide. So the second principle I'm going to talk about is adoption and adaptation. Um, the really key concept to this is that community co colleges all have a unique culture. They vary on a number of different ways, you know, student populations, their geographic po um, factors, demographic factors, the resources they have access to, among many other things. And what's successful in one context and at one community college is not going to necessarily be successful in another college. And it's just critical to understand that you can't use a cookie cutter approach. So this idea of adopting something based on its core elements about what makes that innovation work and then adapting it to fit the needs of the local setting is what's really key to adoption and adaptation. Um, the other thing to understand about the adaptation process itself is that it's ongoing. Uh, it doesn't, and it changes the innovation. So as you're ad adapting an innovation, you're continuing to learn, you're continuing to, to find out what works, and those changes have to be evaluated for if they work just like the original innovation was as the innovation grows, as it's in new settings, and as it's impacting new populations of students. Next slide, please. So this... Uh, Third slide lets me talk about evidence, our third, the third principle in my lineup. Um, those on our team know this is one I'm very um, uh, close to. Transformative leaders, and again, we're talking about that distributed idea of leaders, um, use evidence. It informs their decision making. It even informs the decision making at the very early stages of deciding what to adopt. What innovation is going to work, you have to look at both the evidence from the innovation, but also the evidence that tells you about the context and whether this will work in your context. In every stage going forward from there, evidence plays a key role. Um, how you adopt it, um, how, what populations to work with, how to adapt it, whether the adaption works, those are all things that you understand because you use your use of evidence. Um, one of the realities with this is that you need resources to do this work. It uh, takes resources to collect this data, to analyze this data, and to disseminate this data. So those are that's a key part of understanding evidence. Um, the other thing about using evidence is you also use evidence to show your value. And part of that is to be able to influence the change that's necessary in order for the innovation to be fully successful, especially as it's scaling to new environments or new populations. That value that you're able to demonstrate through evidence can be used to influence policy and practice changes that allow you to be even more effective. Next slide. So the last uh, principle that I get to talk about is storytelling. 
Um, I think storytelling in a lot of ways is something that we grow up with and so we use and sometimes we take for granted, but it's so critical in what we do. Um, it's used in a lot of different ways. Uh, stories are used to build buy-in. They're used to promote information. Uh, they're used to share information. They're used to expand people's knowledge, and that's probably one of the most critical ways that they're used for um, people who are trying to promote an innovation or trying to, to disseminate an innovation as you're helping people to learn. Um, and you're also giving them enough information to understand how it worked in a specific context. So when that adoption process is happening, or adaption process is happening, you're able to look at that and understand how it might need to be changed to work in your context. Um, good understandings build under, or good stories build understanding. Um, they're concise. They focus on what's needed by the audience. Um, and the other thing is they, they need to be told by storytellers who are good at the craft, who are able to tell a compelling story that feature a variety of stakeholder groups and then engage a diverse set of audiences. Um, next slide. So at this point, we're going to take a pause in talking about the guiding principles, and I have the, the pleasure of getting to ask Leah Woodkey to provide us a little insight based on her experience with the Demand Consortium. Leah, how are you sharing information? Who are the storytellers and who are the audiences in the Demand Consortium? Thank you. Um, I, the, the tribal colleges that I work with have not historically done a lot of um, outside storytelling, so the tech grant was really an opportunity for them to build on that. Storytelling is considered one of those um, culturally relevant strategies for teaching and, and sharing information. So really made sense for this project. They hired an outside studio, Makochi um, Studios. You know, you talked about having someone who, who is adept at telling stories. This particular Makochi is really good at, at going out and talking to a variety of people and helping them tell their story in a way that, that is sometimes entertaining. Um, they also hired a, a group called the 1491s. Who the, the 1491s are a Native American comic group. Humor is something that's well understood through Indian country too, and it's a great tool to um, address some difficult topics. And so they did things like like uh, the Warrior Brothers and, and what it means to be a modern day warrior and kind of did a spin on that. I told you we were focusing on um, unemployed men and so this was a way to kind of tap into that. And I'd, I'd invite you to check it out on, on YouTube. There's some really great uh, videos of the 1491s but also other ones. They've um, included project coordinators telling stories, college executives, they've included student voices, so they've interviewed students and told their stories, some of their success stories and some of their struggles in, in you know, how the colleges have helped them along their career path. Um, they've also had faculty tell about their, about their programs. And some of the interesting results um, were that it's really, changing the regional understanding and reputations of the colleges. They're, the typical idea of the tribal colleges is that you have to be Native American to attend them, and that's not true. They have some great training programs, and so regional businesses and industries are starting to uh, create more partnerships with them to help them in their own training needs. And that's really something very brand new for, for these colleges. The other thing is that it's gotten the colleges to work together in messaging. So they've come together in, in um, deciding what's the best way to get the message out. They've worked together towards promoting, I mean, the demand is just well known throughout this whole area now because of all of the, all of the uh, storytelling. They've, they've also included um, newsletters, local newsletters, and even newspapers. Um, they do some radio. Um, Ani Nakota has a regular radio spot on their tribal radio. 
And then they've also even shown some videos in their movie theater because they know that a lot of people attend there and it's a great way to get the message out. So they've used a variety of ways, um, some common to the project and some that are unique to their local settings and, and that work well within their own tribal systems. And really, they, and for Facebook, they use that in a way that they've never used before either. It's been an opportunity to learn about social media and how to, how to get the word out so they use it for announcements and, and put out inspirational messages, but they also use it for sharing progress on projects. Um, I keep, you know, Ani again, they're building a, a new building for the college that the demand students are building a new, a new building and using it as their lab, and so they're tracking that on Facebook. It's a great way to share pictures and, and information. Great. Now we have an opportunity for all of you to participate. Um, we have a poll question for you, uh, so feel free to jump right in and answer. What principle stands out as being or having been most critical to your current or recent work? Is it leadership, adoption and adaptation, evidence or storytelling? Please choose one and uh, jump right in now. We'll have the results in just one second. All right, two more seconds and we'll close this poll. It looks like um, it looks like most of you chose adoption and adaptation, but it was very close to leadership. So very interesting results for us. Thank you. We're going to move on. Um, Deborah Ritchie's going to share. Um, we're going to move on to our next four guiding principles and hear from Deborah Ritchie. Great. Thanks, Mary Ann. I'm really happy to be here today to talk with you and share some highlights about our next four guiding principles. The first one I want to uh, talk with you about is networks. Networks are an important part of the transformative change process because they connect people with multiple perspectives and areas of expertise. And with these different perspectives and different expertise, we find that there's an opportunity for new insights that can facilitate change, even accelerate change. People have, an idea, have a chance to put forward new ideas, to learn from others, their successes, their failures, their evidence, and to receive support for moving forward with their change initiatives. And Heather talked with you about change leaders. Change leaders build and utilize networks. They understand that a collaborative effort is essential to initiate and scaling change. There can be multiple networks operating, working separately, working collectively. And as we think about higher education, as we think particularly about community colleges, it's important to uh, remember to include faculty and students and multiple stakeholders in, in the networks that we build to scale change. In addition to ch sharing the knowledge that occurs in networks, when we think about what happens within networks, it's important to recognize that relationships are developed, that networks share an identity and they share a commitment to working collectively. And this shared information, shared identity, and shared commitment really helps to reduce the local and siloed work that we've heard about and seen about that, that needs to be addressed if, if impact is going to occur, if real change is going to happen, if we're going to address the complex problems that confront our colleges. So within networks, people learn, they participate, they share expertise, ideas, strategies, they storytell, they collect evidence, all of which is critical to innovating and scaling transformative change. 
Next, I'll talk with you about technology. And we deliberately separate out technology and network for, and I hope you'll see why as I, as I talk a bit further with you. At its core, technology connects change leaders in ways they haven't been connected before, to other people, to resources, to ideas, and data. These connections enable and energize change process. When people think about taking an innovation to a larger context for a broader impact. Technology is a critical element in creating that environment of innovation, as well as sustaining and scaling it. The technology tools and resources available today offer ways for people to easily and rapidly communicate within their networks. They share information, they give technical assistance, they work collaboratively in networks and use technology. Early attention by change leaders to how technologies and tools and platforms can be used can facilitate the change process, increase participation, and increase access. Perhaps through the use of virtual networks, change can be um, implemented and moved forward in ways that also help innovators save cost. The third principle I, I'd like to talk with you about today is the dissemination principle. Dissemination is about helping the stakeholders learn about and make sense of the innovation. Whether you're disseminating an innovation within one organization or across organizations and systems, people need to learn about the innovation and they need to understand what it means for them and for their organization. And as Heather talked about when she talked about adopting and adapting an innovation, in complex organizations, dissemination is not about replicating using a recipe. You hear, you know, you understand when people talk about what works over there won't work here. So dissemination gives attention to translating the innovation and identifying who those key translators are is an important part of this process. Translators across all levels are engaged within the organization and across different points in time as the innovation is understood, adapted, implemented, and then scaled because context changes over time and the user engagement continues to understand what's happening and what additional adaptation might be needed. And finally, I want to talk with you about spread and endure as an important principle in thinking about transformative change. Simply, spread is about broadening the impact of the innovation. Innovations that result in improved performance are great. The challenge is in thinking about moving that innovation from the local setting, one department, one college, one consortia, to spreading it across organizations, across consortia, across states, across the country. And endurance is about how long an innovation will last. And in thinking about that, to think about what processes are needed to ensure that longe longevity. So in thinking about what has the potential to bring those breakthrough results, what is the best idea? Change leaders include and inspire others to participate and to move beyond comfort zone to think about that best idea, to develop and reward that culture of innovation that lends itself to a commitment to change over time. And with that commitment comes the requisite investment of resources and attention to the vision of continuous lasting change. Because the innovation is going to look different in a year or two or five than it did when it was first implemented. 
That ends our discussion of the principles. I will say that, uh, as you can see, the principles are not absolutely discrete. Uh, we see and understand the connection between them. And we're going to move now. We post a question to uh, Maria Fief, uh, and she's here now to share her response with the question about what role technology has played in their scaling efforts. Maria? Thank you again, Deborah. So uh, CDC out of Atlanta not too long ago did a study that correlated student connectedness between their learning and academic success rates. And they found that students who are better connected to their own learning will be more successful in school. And so we, this project, CHEO, takes that message seriously. Our instructional designers are teaching faculty how to create e talking emails and mini lecture captures using free online tools from sites like Jing.com or create talking avatars using Vokey, pictograph charts for infographics to better connect learners to their own thinking. Designers are using openforus.org sites and are readily finding OER that's applicable. Instructors incorporate widgets and progress monitoring surveys in order to best personalize that learning experience. We want online and hybrid settings to offer the learner authentic and applicable learning experiences. And CHEO designers have put together a resource list that I understand we'll share with you uh, just a little later. In addition to our state-of-the-art web-based labs that can serve students quite literally from across the globe, I'm in love with this whole light board business. So picture this, part chalkboard, part projection screen, this device floats a lesson in the space between the instructor and the student generating a kind of virtual reality, engaging the online learner in a way that most traditional platforms simply cannot do. Um, we heard Deb refer to the idea of recrease, decreasing costs using technology. Well, the light board that was originally developed at Northwestern University has been redesigned, taking the cost from $150,000 to closer to $7,000 start to finish. And Dr. David Long out of Flathead Valley has provided step-by-step -step building instructions, and those can be found at svcc.edu and will eventually be posted on both of our repositories as well. And just one more. Our colleges are working with um, our employer partners who provide support like space, supplies, and equipment, and they are having great success with simulation labs. So these feel like real simulations give students authentic learning experiences in using fully loaded ambulances to teach emergency medicine to those students who may be remotely located or provide blood banking experiences that can leave students feeling as though they've actually provided real, true, hands-on care for a patient. These well-designed, hands-on simulation labs build mirror neurons in the brain, actually changing the way we process information. And these scenarios very naturally promote reflection and help us encode information in our short and longer-term memory. It's literally building muscle memory for your brain. Mirror neurons developed through the sim labs create deep and sustainable learning experience so that when one of our graduates steps onto the job, we know that they are keenly prepared for what lies ahead, like they've already been in the position for some time. It's impressive. Thanks for asking, Deborah. Appreciate that. Thank you both so much. Um, now we have another chance for everyone to participate. Um, the question again is, what principle stands out as being or having been most critical to your current or recent work? And the, the, uh, the principles in question now are networks, technology, dissemination, spread and endurance. So you can choose one. I'll have the results for you in just a minute. Just one more minute. And it looks like most of you went with technology. Again, very interesting results for us. Thank you. So I think now is a great time for us to open it up for questions. Um, please type in any questions that you might have into the questions section. Um, you can type those in and I'll collect them. I do have some questions that, we've been, that you've been asking all along. So I'm going to go ahead and pose those to our panel. Um, the first question that I have is, 
Um, this person asks, it's especially, I'm especially interested in change inside the classroom. Are there ways that the speakers are engaging faculty as leaders and key implementers within their project? Well, this is Maria Fief, and um, I can say that through the work of our instructional designers, um, faculty are learning about the many, many different opportunities that they can use, not only in an online setting, but can bring into their classroom. For example, they're flipping their classrooms and providing lecture up front, so it's pre-homework, so that when they come to class, they have that um, that early knowledge built in, and instructors can um, deepen that learning experience for them with um, project-based learning and, um, and um, activities that are more applicable to sustaining the learning that took place in the mini lecture captures. Well, Mary Ann, yes. let me um, just, if I could just add, this is Deborah. I think one thing that's been so interesting and uh, important about the community college involvement in the TAC grants is that there are many, many faculty who are involved in the curriculum development process themselves. So that means interacting with um, employers and bringing that knowledge of what is really needed in the workplace to be uh, to be a part of the curriculum from day one and that kind of engagement of the faculty really does help to build buy-in and it builds their own excitement about teaching and uh, really interacting with the students. So being a faculty member myself, I can attest to how important it is to me to be part of an initiative from the beginning. And I think where we've seen uh, community colleges in, do, in uh, engaging with faculty from the beginning, even before there's a class to teach, you know, even before the curriculum is developed, um, those are ways to engage faculty and get their excitement when that content moves into the classroom. Thank you. Um, the next question that we have is, um, there was a question about where did the principles come from? Hmm. Okay, I can, I can, I um, was trying to be relatively quick in my comments, but you're, that's a great question. Um, our team has read extensively about scaling of educational innovations across the P20 system. We've read a lot about scaling of social innovations. We've read about scaling in the private sector and how we think about that. Out of that literature, we really pulled some common themes that we thought might be part of um, a transformative change initiative. But in order to ground this work, we formed work groups. Um, and last summer, there were seven work groups, because actually uh, a principal emerged from that work. But we had seven work groups that involve individuals who have been part of the community colleges and part of the TAC grants. Um, those groups met in two or three or four phone calls in which uh, we started with sort of a general idea about what, um, what it might mean to scale uh, with some of these themes. And these principles emerged out of the very real work that is going on right now in the community colleges uh, and with partners to scale innovation. Um, the next question is, how do you engage workforce development and college job placement programs? This is Maria, and um, our career coaches do a really nice job of reaching out to both employers and to workforce. We have a college um, that actually goes out, several of our colleges go out um, at, in, in pairs with the workforce to meet with employers um, to talk about what are the needs that aren't being met and what kind of services can be provided, um, that kind of thing. And so it's super important that those relationships are nurtured and developed and, and um, grown along the way. Mary, and I would also add, kind of give a shout out to another consortium, um, 
the Mo Health Wins Consortium in Missouri, where many of the coaches uh, spend time in the career centers, in the workforce centers. They spend time, uh, sometimes a whole day or two days a week, where they're actually embedded in those centers, meeting with individuals who they're who may be able to benefit from these programs. But I would also say that uh, where these kinds of workforce partnerships work so well is where from the very beginning there has been a commitment uh, to the workforce agencies and, and WIBs as partners. Um, and so these opportunities are a natural extension um, you know, to work with uh, individuals who are connected to the workforce centers when it's already viewed as a part of the partnership. And I do want to say that I think this is a critical critical element to scaling. Uh, many of these innovations are also very applicable, not, not just to the community college context, but also applicable to the larger workforce context and um, opportunities to scale in that way it are also, I think, uh, a real real benefit to, um, to the TAC grants. Good. This is Deborah. Uh, I'll add a concrete example from some of the um, learning that, that I've had in working with consortia. Uh, a concrete example at one consor within one consortium with their um, members of college groups sit on advisory boards for the workforce and the workforce people sit on advisory boards at the college levels. So at referring back to your comment, Deborah, about that early partnership and commitment, seeing, you know, connecting the leadership of the, the two groups in, in larger conversations about what's happening in the communities around workforce development and training employees. We have time for just a couple more questions. Um, and Maria, I think um, these next couple that I'm going to group together are, are um, directed to you. Um, one person wants to know the name of the new tool from from the online healthcare the, that the online healthcare folks are using. If you could just name the tools again, and also um, someone is asking about um, the evidence that you have to support the claims of the impact that the, that the technology you're using is having on the learning for your students. If you could just talk a little bit about the evidence that you're gathering. You bet. We work with a third-party evaluator, as do all the tax projects, and our third party is Rutgers University, who is doing a beautiful job of developing case studies and, um, and filtering through the multitude of data that we are collecting to try to determine um, validity and reliability of the processes that we're putting into place. Those case studies are um, the first collection have just been completed and we will be posting them on our website and you're welcome to take a look there. So the evidence-based work that the instructional designers are using um, are coming out of pedagogical studies created by groups like Quality Matters. And um, so our instructional designers um, evaluate and map the courses. Um, they break them down to make some decisions about what's been included and what could be added in, in order to strengthen the pedagogical approach, approach based on um, what evidence says works best with students. And so some of those tools, again, uh, there are a lot of free tools online, like uh, jing.com. Um, there's, there's one called Picta Chart. It's P-I-K-T-O chart. There's a Vokey where you can build your own avatar and put different clothes and hair styles and that on them and then embed them into your um, learning management system, into your lesson so that it creates this different sense behind, um, behind the connection for the student. So um, there, there is a lot of research out there that supports many of the processes that are in place within the CHEO project. And I'm happy to speak with 
anyone who's interested in talking more about that individually. Perfect, and we have your contact information on, on one of the last slides. So I just have one more question that I want to try and fit in. Um, this last question says, I have difficulty with trying new types of delivery or different scheduling because of rules around class size and faculty pay restrictions. Does someone have experience on ways to engage the department and college leadership to play outside the traditional sandbox? I can speak to that a little bit. <clears throat> with the block scheduling, that was one of the, um, one of the challenges is that when uh, you have students from 8 a.m. until almost 5 p.m. every day. That is an instructional overload. And um, so what they've done is they've um, reduced faculty responsibilities in other areas like meeting times and committee work and all of that kind of thing. But they've also doubled the, the number of instructors that they would typically have. So every, every program tries to have at least two instructors. Not everyone has, has been able to do that, but um, you know the tribal colleges don't have some of the challenges that some of the other colleges do either. With you know, like um, some of the I, I suppose internal political challenges, um, but it, it is it is tough, and you have to have administrative or executive buy-in for that. Not only not only for the amount of time to paying them extra, but also paying them um, what the more more along the lines of what they would make in the industry. So those have been things that they've worked through. Thank you. Thank you all for the, the great questions. This last slide has um, some resources for you um, and some links to TCI resources and um, Pueblo Community College instructional design team resources um, that you can go to and then we also have some contact information and I'm sure that anyone would be happy to answer any of your questions directly as well. The slides will be available online and um, as will the webinar um, and we, I will send an email out to make all of that available to you. This is Deb Bragg. I just want to thank everybody for being on the webinar today, and we're, we're really pleased and excited about this project. Um, we move into a research phase where we get the opportunity and, uh, and are really looking forward to the chance to really see how these uh, scaling principles play out on the ground in, in the work that consortium are doing, and we'll continue to share that information with you through a webinar series that we'll uh, plan for uh, this this summer and this academic year. So thanks again, everyone. It's it's been a great opportunity. I really want to thank Maria and Leah for being with us today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye bye.